the second floor. You see somebody here, and that is Scott Weaver, who is right here in our house. Welcome to Rolling Through the Bay. Um, this is um, what we believe may be the world's largest functioning toothpick sculpture. It just made a 3,000 plus mile trip from San Francisco, unwrapped, uncrated, in the back of a truck. Um, Rebecca is, she is the reason I'm here. I would not have done this for, I've never considered bringing this across the country. It is San Francisco in my vision. Visionary Arts Museum, this is where it needed to be. Um, <clears throat> what happens is, I, I had these little sculptures as a kid that had balls that rolled through them. They, did, they were very abstract. Um, I came up with the city later on. Five generations, a, a brief history, five generations of our family. My sister Jan is here filming for me. I'm right here. Um, she, uh, we grew up in San Francisco. My great grandfather came over from Bellinzona in the 1870s, started a wine cellar saloon right here, the Lorenzo Verde Wine Cellar. He bought a house for my grandmother, 518 12th Avenue, between Ann's and Balboa. Um, my other grandfather had a gymnasium, 2350 Geary. Um, I've got the times of my son was born, my wife, my mother, that I'm going to describe to you in a moment. What it is, it has 104,587 pieces of toothpick. Figure that one out. It has, it has um, five ping pong ball tours that give my vision and my, my description of San Francisco that I'm going to give you right now. What happens is... I engineered it so balls rolled, rolled down. And I want, what I wanted you to see, what you wanted the world to see is a, a sculpture of San Francisco that no one can tell something happens until you put a ball. So I would ask kids whenever they see it, what is the title? This little biplane pulling a banner. Wow. Rolling through the bay. Rolling through the bay means something happens. The ball spirals down 10 times on the inside of the Coit Tower. Goes by my great grandfather's wine cellar and saloon, behind the rice grating, rice grating cable car. You can see my head face here in the Transamerica building looking up into my vision. There goes that word again. From the old time, night, early 1900s Cliff House, the French Chateau Cliff House in San Francisco. They now are coming down Lombard Street. It meanders back and forth. This little street sign says Lombard and Grant. Grant Avenue is Chinatown. They come by this little dragon of the Kabbalah. They go into the Palace of Fine Arts. So inside my heart, I love San Francisco. This little heart. This was made out of toothpicks that friends and family threw at my wife and I coming out of a church 22 years ago. The balls go out around the windmill out at Ocean Beach. They come and they go through the toll booth. It has a time my son Tyler was born. They go across the Golden Gate Bridge. Looking off the Golden Gate Bridge, you can see the famous humpback whale, Humphrey the Whale. He's splashing goodbye to us, thanking us for getting him out of San Francisco Bay. The balls then go behind Alcatraz Island back here, and then they come by a little silhouette of myself swimming from Alcatraz for the sixth time. They then come down. It's a very fun swim. They then come down into the Maritime Museum here at Aquatic Park at Ghirardelli Square and end in Flyshacker Pool. That makes no geographical sense whatsoever. <laughs> the Oakland Bay Bridge Tour starts up in another round circle and meanders up high over the cable car. The centrifugal force brings it past this little hole and then it comes back to that hole. That one just almost collided. They go past my grandfather's Gymnasium 2350 Geary behind Chinatown. They come out of a tunnel and go around the Open Bay Bridge. Looking off the bridge, you can see a sailboat practicing for the America's Cup. You're welcome to come to the city in 2013 and see this again there. The ball goes around the Open Bay Bridge, dropping down in by the World Series trophy of the Giants. It goes in Impact Ball Park. They have a Coke ball. It goes into the Coke ball, around the mid, down into Impact Ball Park, comes into the Ferry Building Clock Tower. At Pier 39 area, it goes, the clocks have the time I was born on it, the time my mother was born on it, and the time my wife was, Rochelle was born on it. She's very glad that the sculpture's out of the living room. The balls, <laughs> then, the balls then go by these two little escaping crabs here at Fisherman's Wharf, and they end here in a clamshell by a little rowboat. Uh, the Powell Street Cable Car Tour, this one goes down. The world famous rainbow colored toothpicks of the Castro district, right there, we're in the city. If you watch very closely, you'll see the balls take a brief momentary stop. 
in the driveways of the Alma, the Steiner Street houses, and then continue on their way <laughs> to the red light district. <laughs> they also go past myself doing a handstand on my skateboard that I still do. I did that for my grandfather before he passed away. They will then jump on John F. Kennedy Drive and go through Golden Gate Park. You can see the De Young Museum back here, the music concourse. Golden Gate Park is a man-made park so they brought in foliage from all around the world. All my toothpicks are from all around the world. I just uh, got some from Bali, um, Europe. I've got some from Scotland, Italy, um, right by across the street from Big Ben, China, Morocco, Spain. And I just installed, Rebecca doesn't know this, I just installed this toothpick, the dirty one, with uh, the, the grilled onions upstairs. Oh! Yesterday. There is a toothpick from Avam right there. <laughs> Those balls actually drop down into the center of the window out at Ocean Beach. And then they drop down by the Missouri battleship. They got decommissioned. They decided not to leave it in San Francisco. It goes out by the Ferris wheel here at Playland, San Francisco. It drops down in underneath the nose of my shirt boy as I'm shooting the tube on the Ocean Beach wall and the end at the fun house that I'll come right back to in just a moment. But then there's the High Street Cable Car Tour. This one goes through the interior of the homes checking for any code violations. <laughs> and then they come out and they take a very short trip on BART. They don't like the view of the bay from under the water, so they get they decide to get out and take the Oka Bay Bridge again once again, dropping down into the um, Embarcadero where the sculpture will be one year again. But this is the first place it needed to come. The last tour is kind of a natural tour of, of rolling through the bay. I call the Mount Tam tour. You fly like an eagle through the majestic redwoods of Mount Tamalpais and Muir Woods. The toothpicks I've got, this is the first time I'm telling this story. A teacher of my son just went to the top of Kilimanjaro. He was at 18,700 feet in the crater and eating underneath a canopy, eating with the, some of the expedition. And uh, this guy was eating some things and throwing these toothpicks in the ash. And he said, Scott Weaver, in his head. And he said, can I have those toothpicks? He picked them up, put them in his backpack. The next morning, they went to the summit of Mount Kilimanjaro. And he brought them to me. And so they go from kind of the top up to the summit on the on your side, up to the top of Mount Tamalpais, which is in San Francisco Bay Area. That's our mountain. So those balls, they, they being the natural tour that it is, they go through the redwoods of Muir Woods and Mount Tam. Um, they go by a crystal that I bought that's kind of in the center of my sculpture that I bought my wife and I the week we met. They go past the original Hey Ashbury Magic Mushroom Patch right there. <laughs> And then they jump on, they jump on John F. Kennedy Drive and go through Gold. They take a trip through, yes, pun intended, through Golden Gate Park by the Old Young Museum, the Music Concourse, and then they drop down into the to the window once again here at Ocean Beach, dropping in by the Pacific Ocean, out at the Ferris wheel once again, underneath the tube, and they end at the Playland Funhouse, San Francisco. That's rolling through the bay. Thank you. My wife said I'm not allowed to wear this in public, but... Well, we're in family. Can I take a picture? Yes. We actually need a good picture of this. Yeah, we do. Please give it. If anyone has a good picture, please bring, give it to Rebecca. She wants it. Okay. How long did it take you to do this? Um, I've been working, this is, uh, it's on right at thir year 37, um, and that's what's enabled me to do something for the pleasure of doing it. Um, I have two friends that I grew up with that we've all done art together, you know, off and on, and they do it for uh, their trade, and I, I, making this, I could never have made this if I did it, if I did art uh, for a living. Um, this was a love of just building, knowing that I would love to make people think why and wonder why would some, why would some eccentric person spend, you know, over 3,000 hours of their life building one piece. And I've always had this story and <clears throat> until about a week ago, I never knew it was going to come out and it's, this is happening right now. There's magic in this room. I did some landscaping and because it was in the area of New York, I did a little seismic retrofitting to bring it out. <laughs> <laughs> 
but um, you start with? my wife is very patient. I started with a very abstract, I call this weaver webbing down here, it's very dark. Those toothpicks right there are, are 36, 37 years old. From the fourth grade. And they're, and they're still holding. So it was very whimsical and flowing. And I tied in the fun parts. So there's so many moves that I've been in life that I've gone through building this sculpture that um, that I could see where I was um, at that point. I, I put hundreds of hours just thinking aesthetically. Um, three representations of flight, motor power, just human and bird. Um, the Pacific Ocean into the center of the city, um, into the bay side. So people that have grown up in the city will look at it and realize why things aesthetically are in, in the place that they are. I was sitting on an airplane with this really chatty woman and then she said this one thing to me. She said, you know, I've heard that you can be successful at three things in life. Work, family, and health. Pick two. Wow. And I thought, oh my God, that is like so true. Like it, <laughs> but you are the one person I have met who has been incredibly successful with your family, in your work. I know you're a produce manager and love there, but what you've done to make the, also the, he didn't even bring up that he did the top prize for a homemade uh, a Christmas environment in the country. He didn't like bring that up until whatever. And then he has swam, you know, made the, the what's the word, past tense. He, he has, he swum, he swam, yeah. he swam. <laughs> <laughs> We've been up a lot. <laughs> 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 uh, from Alcatraz, to the San Francisco oh. six times. Oh, come on. Okay, yeah. so we got it all going, honey. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. You know, he didn't really know us, and so to convince him to come here, oh. I kept on saying, oh. I've seen a lot of brilliant um, uh, matchstick and toothpick artwork. And uh, we're lucky to have Wayne Cousy, who was someone you admire, his, his ship downstairs, and Gerald Hawks in this show, his matchstick work. But you know what? Trees, there are no square roots when it comes to trees. A, a tree is a circle by nature that becomes this elongated oh. circle, goes up. All the rings, everything is circular about trees. But when people take matchsticks, they tend to do very square work. It's just what they, how they build, like Lincoln Logs, you know? Um, and I have never, if you notice on the back here, the central thing that holds it together is this voluptuous uh, circle in the back of toothpicks. But the fact that, that your, your, your pathways are like helixes of DNA, how they propel you know, the balls forward. Many people may have ever come across the, a guy named Victor Schauberger, who a book called Living Water is about. And he was an Austrian naturalist. And he became a great inventor, not because he went to school, but because he could really look at nature and learn from its secrets. And one of the things he noticed was uh, something that won him a competition. He was Austrian, but he was extremely anti um, uh, Hitler. And he, there was a competition how to get trees off of mountains and down below quickly. And you would think the, sh you know, the shortest line, a straight shoot, would be the fastest thing to do. And he had watched water and ponds at different uh, temperatures change the buoyancy of carrying heavy objects. And so he designed what is now the accepted practice. Instead of a straight line, he did the sinusoidal kind of curves all the way down a mountain. So it's much more square footage for a log to travel. But what happens is, from doing, being involved in that motion, it's like why streams meander. It picks up energy and propels faster. So this, uh, the kind of log shoots that you see like that will get a log down below faster than a straight one. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. So there's, you know, sometimes, that's what I love about this museum, is sometimes the obvious is actually wrong, you know. And uh, your, your, the, the curves and the joy and the documentation between your life. You also told me that this is one of the few abstract other than your early work. And I see you have circles all over that as well. All right, it's my pleasure. I got to meet 
great for the first time when we were supposed to judge people's art, which is a horrible thing to have to do. But we made it fun. We made it fun. We did make it fun. But what you have to know is that Greg and I were born in the same year, the year of the dragon coming up, almost 60 years ago. And um, what was so strange, when I was conceiving of the show with Dolly, I thought of that Dusty Springfield, very sexy, wonderful old song called uh, The Windmills of Our, Our Mind, you know, round like a circle of a spiral. Then one of the words in the lines in that song is, uh, and the earth is like an apple spinning silently in space. And when Gray got up to speak to the group about his art, that song, by, sung by someone else, with the same lyric, was so pivotal to him. And I already decided to have that in the show. And if you will tell about Yuri Gagarin and your entry into wonder. This yes. is an astronomer artist, my great friend, Ringboard. Thank you, everyone. And I have to uh, congratulate Rebecca for this awesome experience that we're all having. And uh, when she was speaking over at, at the other building about the emptiness of space, and you look at Scott's uh, unbelievable sculpture, you have to re be reminded of what Rebecca said, that that it's mostly empty space. You know, it's just an incredible thing. If we if we squeeze all those toothpicks together, it would just be a little, a little box about that big. So I really applaud the, the, the genius of the two artists that we've seen so far. And uh, it's a great honor to be here and to be at the museum. Uh, I am a product of the, the space age. And I was born, uh, like Rebecca, in 1952. Is that, yeah. is that correct? And I remember uh, being a child and my dad taking us out to watch uh, Sputnik over. That was in 1957. Uh, Fifty years later, I learned uh, very sadly that uh, I, you actually couldn't see Sputnik. All you could see was the booster. So that was a little bit of a letdown. But um, I spent my, my childhood being fascinated by uh, uh, astronauts and cosmonauts and people uh, with a no the wild notion of getting to the moon. So uh, I've always had an interest in space science. Uh, but I've also always been an artist. It's something I've done ever since I was a child, just drawing when I should have been paying attention to uh, the geometry class. But uh, at some point in the, in the 80s, uh, shortly after I had uh, started my professional art career, and I am predominantly a, a painter in, in watercolor and some oil, um, I was able to bring my love for science and art together. And uh, again, reflecting on what Rebecca said, I'm always fascinated by the, the, um, the interplay of science and art. And if you think of, about someone like Leonardo da Vinci, who was a, a, clearly a scientist and an engineer, but also an incredible artist, there's always been this amazing link between understanding how something works, uh, understanding the essence of, of, of an object, or um, and science and art are very similar in these, in these matters. And I think it was Leonardo that said, art is the true daughter of science. I believe that's a, a quote from him. So um, I was very pleased to be part of this show. And as, as Rebecca told us the story about the, the windows of your mind, um, one of the things that I've grown more and more aware of as time has gone by is the, the connected uh, quality in nature between the large and the small. And this is one of my favorite themes. And when you, when you think about something like the super collider in CERN, Switzerland, where we collide atomic particles and we, and we watch what happens when the, these, these subatomic, subatomic particles smash together, um, we see that they come out and they make these beautiful designs which are all, all spirals. And if you see in the, the upper right picture there called the, the golden spiral, you see a, sort of a spiraling subatomic particle. And also you see a spiral galaxy in the background, which is a, an enormous spiral. So everywhere we look in nature, we are constantly reminded of this amazing confluence of, of, of repeatability, of beauty. Everywhere we look, it's, it's uh, nature saying, this is how I work, this is beautiful. Um, some of the most, the most amazing bodies in the universe, of course, are, are spheres which is in large part what the show is about. You know, you think about the, um, a billiard ball on your, on your pool table and how smooth around that is. Well, that's not smooth at all. If, you, if we ever have a chance to go and look at a neutron star, a neutron star, which is 
smaller than a city but weighs, weighs more than a million suns, that is a very smooth object. And again, it's a sphere. You know, and when raindrops fall, those are spheres. So one of the most beautiful objects in the universe, in the, in the universe that we know, are spheres. And there's a reason for that. It's, it's the, the, the conservation of energy and shape. So um, uh, I love that she put the quote up there about from Yuri Gagarin because you know he was the first human being to go into orbit. That was in 1963, I believe. And much to his surprise, much to Yuri's surprise, and the world's surprise, was that he looked down and he said, the Earth is a blue ball. Now, it doesn't seem very profound to us today, but 50 or 60 years ago, this was an amazing event because, you know, what would be the first reaction of a human being seeing the Earth from afar? And his reaction was that it was blue, and that it was, it was like a bowling ball in space. So we, in the year 2011, soon to be 2012, we are, we are blessed, but we're also cursed with the, the awareness that we can see ourselves from afar. And this has led to revolutionary thinking about um, who we are and where we live in the cosmos. One of my, my heroes is, of course, Carl Sagan, who um, championed many and took part in many scientific explorations. And if you all remember the two Voyager spacecraft that shot off towards the outer planets um, in the 70s, Voyager 1 and Voyager 2, they were the first spacecraft to look at the outer planets close up, which are also spheres. Um, but Carl, at some point after the spaceship was, was literally billions, and I'll say that like Carl, billions of miles away from, from the Earth, he had this really cool idea. He said, let's turn the spacecraft around. Let's look at the Earth from five billion miles away. And uh, one of, the, one of the, the, the things that came out of that was this, uh, what he called the pale blue dot. And in the Voyager camera, the Earth, uh, surrounded by some of the other inner planets, appears only as a, a tiny blue speck in space. So this inspired one of his last books before he died called Pale Blue Dot, which um, I was very honored to have a, a piece of artwork in Pale Blue Dot. And this one is called The Fabric of Space. And <clears throat> it's, um, it's the lead image in, in the book for a chapter called A Universe Not Made for Us. The universe not made for us. Because if you look at the history of human beings, we were under the great delusion that we were the center of all things, that we were the center of the circle, that everything moved around us. So it has been a, uh, an amazing journey to realize that we are not in the center of things. So um, what this picture demonstrates is that uh, when, you, when you send off a spacecraft or when you ask a question, when you have an inquiry, you might be surprised as to what the answer is. So this is what uh, science has taught us, that no, we're not the center of the universe. Um, we're not even the center of the Milky Way galaxy. The Milky Way galaxy is not even, even the center of anything. We're just, we're just one planet, a lonely planet, lost in the outskirts of a galaxy in a universe where there are more galaxies than there are people on Earth. So we are, we are very small, we are very obscure. And but what this does is, it reflects on, our, on ourselves and we realize at this point, which everyone is coming to the enlightenment of, that we have to cherish the, the, the ball, the sphere that we're on. So these are, these are disturbing ideas, but they're also very powerful. So what I've tried to do with my artwork is to, is to um, re remind the viewer of these incredible things that we are now a part of, that we have learned. So I might do it by encircling uh, an, an apple with uh, the rings of Saturn. I like, to, I like to disturb and challenge the viewer. I like to get them thinking. Now, someone very coyly said that if only I had made the apple an onion, then it could have been called onion rings. Yeah. <laughs> so bad. Yeah, so bad. <laughs> um, but I, again, I have this fascination with science. And if you think about the apples and twirling in space, like the uh, Michelle Legrand song, but also the, the, the story of Isaac Newton watching an apple fall from a tree, which it didn't hit him on the head, by the way. He actually saw from inside his aunt's uh, home. He, was, uh, he lived with his aunt who had an apple orchard. And you know, this is the, one of the pivotal moments in human history when, when Isaac Newton said, well, why doesn't the moon fall down? You know, it seems like a childish question, but no one had asked that before. So when Newton started to think about it, he said, well, Maybe the moon is falling. Of course, come to figure out, the moon is falling. It's just falling around the world. So this led to the whole notion of objects in motion, staying in motion. 
And uh, you know, we still use Newtonian physics to send spacecraft to the other planets. So his ideas were profound, but it all started with, with a round apple falling to the Earth. Of course, being <clears throat> growing up during the Apollo era when we were, we were hell-bent to beat the Russians to get to the moon, um, this, this seemed like a, an amazing thing to do. So at some point in my artistic career, I, I created a painting called Man on the Moon. And I actually um, used oh. myself as the, as the image. It's the one, the little yeah. small one down here next Great. to the Earth is Blue. And uh, again, someone suggested that the painting should be called Moon on the Moon because I, I, I chose to portray <laughs> myself with the, the big <laughs> um, So uh, I like to put a little humor into my artwork as well. Uh, the other, the other self-portrait, and these are the only really two pieces I've ever done. Uh, part of it is just using myself as, as a model because I'm, I'm very cheap. I, the, the, <laughs> I, I, I hire out cheaply. Um, this, this piece of me looking at the cosmos was actually uh, designed for a, a magazine cover called uh, Sky and Telescope. And that particular issue in 1988, I can't believe it's that long ago, uh, was about amateur astronomers. So I wanted to, to portray the ultimate amateur astronomer, and that was one without telescopes, without instruments. It was sort of the, the primitive man uh, when he first awakened and looked up at the sky and started to ask questions. So I used my, myself as the model, and the reason I'm kneeling down is because to, uh, to, do, the, to do the study, I used, uh, I used two different mirrors, and my right hand, you see, is sort of like this, and my right hand is, is a, uh, that's drawing on the drawing pad. So I'm looking at my reflection in two mirrors and actually drawing, so that's kind of de determine the pose of that. But I wanted to portray uh, the most primitive uh, pose, you know, sort of not even standing up, you know, kind of in the, mm -hmm. the primate stage, if you will. But um, we all, <coughs> culture has depended and has been driven in large by uh, our view of the of a night, of the night, the night sky, and particularly the moon and the sun. And uh, I created a piece called Night in Today because I wanted to remind the viewer again that for whatever reason, human beings have evolved to operate in daylight hours. You know, 75 or 80 percent of animals on Earth are nocturnal. They actually operate during the night. So we humans are, are sort of a strange breed. We operate during the daytime. But the real state of affairs, when you go outside and it's a clear night, preferably with no moon, is you see the stars. That's the state of affairs. You know, this is also what I'm trying to remind the viewer of, that we live in a very large, empty space. Uh, for the time being, there's no place else to go. Maybe in the future there might be some place to go. But um, the nighttime is actually the real state of affairs. The, the daytime is the, the sky illuminated. Uh, by the sunlight, so we have this beautiful blue sky today. We're lucky. Thank God it's not raining anymore. Um, but it's uh, the real state of affairs is that we are a, a tiny blue dot in a great void of, of space. So um, I'm very pleased to be here. Um, it's a great honor to uh, to participate in this. Uh, I just I just want to go back to, to Rebecca because she uh, embodies such energy, and it's uh, it's contagious. And I see all the smiles in this room. And, and just uh, this whole place is such an amazing rethinking of what you could do with a museum. I, I'm just thrilled to be here, oh. and I, I thank you and Dottie. And <coughs> that I, is incredible. Uh, you know what I wanted to say too? Yes. Many people think that self-taught artists are do kind of crude kind of work, huh. and I have to tell you, sometimes they're more complex than Escher. And to be able to show what you have done as an intuitive self-taught artist who just pays excruciating attention throughout your whole life is such a privilege to have you here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Much.